To you, it may have been a joke. To others, it was no laughing matter. I'm talking about the recent blackface controversy. We'll give you some history on this and tell you why some of the images you're going to see are still haunting today. Plus, why you may want to visit local museums to uncover the jewels of African American history right here in Pensacola. And we pay homage to our very own hero and legend, General Daniel Chappie James Jr., the first African American four-star general in the Air Force. All of this and much more, The Aware Show starts right now. This original WSRE presentation is made possible by viewers like you. Thank you. Hi, I'm Dee Dee Sharp, and welcome to The Aware Show. Glad to have you right there with us. Extra, extra, read all about it in the news. The blackface controversy involving Democratic Virginia Governor Ralph Northam makes headlines. It all stems around an old yearbook photo which recently surfaced. Want you to take a look at it. The picture shows a person in blackface and another dressed in the Ku Klux Klan's signature white hood and robe. Northam, believed to be one of these characters, initially apologized and agreed he was in the photo, but the next day changed his position and said that was not him in the picture. Well, we'll talk about this revelation and talk about why it's so relevant to our civil rights movements today. But first, here on The Aware Show, we step back in time to bring history from the pages and into local museums. We'll let you know why African American history is everyone's history. And in doing so, we pay tribute to this man, a legend and a hero, General Daniel Chappie James, and distinguished educator, political and the community activist and leader, Ella L. Jordan. And here to tell us more about these great heroes, we have Ellis Jones, who is a board president of the Chappie James Museum. And of course, we have Georgia Blackman. She's a local historian and a member of the Oversight Committee for the Ella L. Jordan African American Museum. Thank you both for being here. Thank, Thank you, you for having the opportunity. Absolutely. Thank you. We've got some great stuff happening here in Pensacola. Yes, we and do. we're so excited about it here on The Aware Show that we wanted to highlight it and have you come on here and tell us what's coming down the pipe for us in embracing African American history, but also helping our viewers know and understand that it's not just African American history, right. it's all of our history, That's and we right. can embrace this. This That's is right. American history, this is Pensacola history. That's right. And we'll do it by talking about. Chappie James, General. I want to make. I'm going to make sure I get that in my head to say General Chappie James, <laughs> and the museum and the Flight Academy. That uh, it's kind of been in operation, but some even better things getting ready to happen here in Pensacola to kind of honor our great hero, General Chappie James. Tell us about it, Mr. Jones. Yes, thank you for the opportunity to be here to talk about the museum and the Flight Academy. As you may know, the Flight Academy and the museum are two separate, distinct operations. Uh, the museum has been in operation since June of 2018. We had a soft opening, which means that we were not fully operational. We didn't have all of our exhibits ready yet, but we anticipate in the next few months, probably March or April, we'll be fully operational with additional exhibits. The Flight Academy is administered by a group of black pilots who actively fly on a regular basis, and we anticipate that they will have their classes resuming in June, mid-June. I urge everyone to look at their Facebook page to obtain more information about registration and uh, enrollment in their classes. Mm -hmm. And I want to talk about Ella Jordan, too, because we've got an African-American man, we've got an Afri African-American woman who we want to honor here on The Aware Show. Tell us about what's coming down the pipe for the Ella Jordan Museum. The Ella Jordan uh, House was uh, built in 1890. Mrs. Uh, Ella Jordan bought it in 1929. Uh, Ivan the Storm uh, destroyed it, uh, and so we started back in uh, 2015 of putting it together. And so we right now we're about 75 percent finished, but it will be the African American, Ella L. Jordan African American Museum, and we expect for it to be open um, this year. 
And you're acquiring pieces as well along this journey. Oh, yes. Getting oh, yes. Open. Oh, yes. Yes, we have a lot of information that's going to go in there that we have because it's going to be the local uh, African-American history, but it's also going to be, you know, uh, United States African American history and we have a lot of the pieces people have donated it like uh, that was um, 12 uh, presidents from Miss Ella Jordan all the way down uh, and they will be there we have their pictures and all and so they will be in the museum and when you say presidents you're talking about the club, mm -hmm, the, club. The, the social club that mm -hmm, she ran mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and what exactly was going on with that and how did uh, African Americans benefit from what she did well they benefited a lot of ways it was the um, it was the uh, Colored Women Federated Club, which you can still Google it and is still in operation today. They had our uh, children program after school's tutoring, uh, and then on Saturday had adequate training for the children in arts and craft. Uh, 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 Booker T. Washington's wife came to that house, uh, Mary McLeod Mathune came to that house, and Eleanor Roosevelt came to that house. It was something, and it, it, like I say, it just closed uh, when Ivan destroyed it, but it did a lot of history for Pensacola, and a lot of things happened a in that house. A lot of prestigious oh, folks yeah. came, came through that, that house. house. Visitors. Yes they, yes, they did. Yes, they did. <laughs> At the uh, table of Miss mm -hmm. Jordan. Oh, That's yes. wonderful that you're oh, yes. embracing that. Oh, yeah. We think about um, all of the contributions that um, General James made to Pensacola by just being uh, who he was. Um, going on and becoming the first African-American gen four-star general in the Air Force, it's quite a feat. What um, history um, do we as Pensacolians need to know and embrace as we get set to, uh, to journey through his museum to come? Well, I think the history really begins with an, own, well, I won't say an unknown aspect of his, of, his, of his life, but his mother, his parents. Both of them play a very important role in his development. His father <clears throat> was a, a laborer, but he was of an entrepreneurial spirit. He managed to work continuously to support the family. And his mother, uh, who was dissatisfied with the role of education in the school system, because during in, in the early 19th, 20th century, there was very little money being spent uh, for educational opportunities for blacks. There were very few schools and the monies meant to hire teachers was just not there. So she started tutoring neighborhood kids in her home. And as the word spread throughout the neighborhood, throughout the community, she added on more and more students. Finally, there were enough students to accommodate a small house in their backyard and ultimately they bought the house next door and at, at the height of her teaching, she had approximately 70 students enrolled in school. 70 students Correct. came through right. that house to be taught right. by Chappie James' mother. Right, and, and when I hear and talk about, I did not attend the school myself, but mm -hmm. when I talked to uh, persons who did attend the school, she had a, a very core, basic, curriculum, reading, writing, arithmetic. But she also encouraged the kids to do plays. They uh, were developed and disciplined in a manner that it was a positive discipline. Mm. And, and I guess the important thing was that she gave them the encouragement and the energy to succeed. Uh, General James always, when he talked about his mother, one of the favorite, his favorite quotes was, there was an 11th commandment, and the 11th commandment was, thou shalt not quit. Mm. So okay. over and over and over again, when he was interviewed, when he talked about his, his upbringing, what was important in his life, he always referred to his mother, his father, and the 11th commandment, thou shalt <laughs> not quit. And he didn't. He did not quit. Correct. Died very early at 58. Yes, but has he did. made a huge mark on our Pensacola history here. Mm -hmm. yes. and, it, and it's really wonderful that mm -hmm. we get an opportunity to continue to honor him mm -hmm. and have something like this. Now with the Flight Academy that has actually been in operation, several youths have come, youth have come through there. Correct. And so uh, now this is just gonna be one more 
bigger expansion with the school being uh, more of the academy, 364, five days a, uh, a year, and then, of course, the museum opening. Right. The, the Flat Academy has been in operation for more than 20 years, mm -hmm. Okay. but they never had a permanent home. Okay. They would fly in and they would have a temporary residence at possibly a church okay. or a airfield or a airport or a hangar. So they would move around as the need fit. So this is their first time to have an actual, an actual home that's permanent and they are overjoyed. And so what can we do to, um, to support these two efforts to embrace African American history and to preserve it? What, what can we do, our viewers do? Well, get to know really what it's about. They are both uh, here, and I think you put our information up there. But get to know, we are still, uh, we're still doing fundraisers. We are still doing, uh, you know, things in the community where we have people to come into the Ella Jordan House and see what we are doing. So, you know, just get involved with us. We need to, uh, as I was listening to Mr. Um, Ellis, you know, they need, they're open, so they need volunteers. Mm. So get, and get involved with us, you know, because uh, our, the community need it, but especially our children, we need to teach our children. And just get involved with us, you know. Okay. Do you have anything to add to that, Mr. Well, Ellis? one of the things that a museum needs are artifacts. We are diligently searching for, especially realistic things that may have been owned by the family, by General James, and it's very difficult to find. We are reaching out to other museums. We have a collective where we are looking at, we will be utilizing Tuskegee, both the Tuskegee National Park Service and the Tuskegee University archives to assist us with loans. But I thought it would be a lot easier, but um, there's, a, there's, a, there's a level of, of uh, Red experience, <laughs> <laughs> that's the word. <laughs> when I call the bigger museums, I find mm -hmm. that they want us to have experience. Okay. They want us to have a track record. Uh, running to all of those things that did not know about. So we're learning as we go. In the meantime, but volunteers. Volunteers. Okay. We need volunteers. We're, we're, we're expanding our board. Uh, so we need board members who have okay. some skills that they can lend to us. Okay. Volunteers for as uh, they can be used to t guide people through the tours, through Very the tours, good. so okay. those are the things that we need. Well, I want to thank you both for what you're doing uh, here in our community. I'm not surprised to see you out there, Ms. Blackman, doing what you do, and I'm so happy that you were here on The Aware Show, and both of you okay. are able to let our viewers know that these wonderful things are going to be going on in our community. You're already working on it, thank and you. hopefully you'll get some support with volunteers and or funds yes. and or uh, artifacts. Thank yes. you. And uh, we'll check back in on you maybe another time, a later date, see how Great. things are going. Thank you so much. All Thank right. you very much. Absolutely. Thank mm -hmm. you also for being here. Our Weir Pays tribute to our local heroes, Daniel Chappie James. I'm going to say General Daniel Chappie James Jr., the first African American four star general and community leader and educator, Ella L. Jordan. We salute as only we can to the legacy of these two great heroes. And if you would like more information on the Chappie James Museum or the Ella Jordan African American Museum, you can call or visit their websites. We have them here for you on the screen, that information for you. All you have to do is jot it down and be sure to go out and visit them soon. Welcome back to The Aware Show. We wanted to turn the pages in our local history and look at some of the positive contributions African Americans have made to American history. But as we turn those pages, we're often confronted with past horrors that creep into our present. The most recent example of this is the blackface controversy. We cannot overcome because we are constantly reminded of it. And here is that reminder. A yearbook photo of Virginia Governor Ralph Northam depicting a person in blackface and another dressed in the Ku Klux Klan's signature white hood and robe. Northam is believed to be one of these characters. He initially apologized and then agreed he was in the photo. But the very next day, he changed his position and said it wasn't him in the picture. Now, more blackface gate. The third ranking elected official in Virginia, Attorney General Mark R. Herring, recently claimed that he too wore a black face at a party as an undergraduate student, thus widening the crisis facing that state's Democratic leadership.
Now here to break all of this down for us here with some historical perspective and future implications are my guests, Reverend H.K. Matthews, a civil rights legend, Jerry McIntosh, president of Movement for Change, and Ellison Bennett, national board member of the National Movement for Human and Civil Rights. And on the phone, we have author, actor, and musician, Daryl Davis, who wrote the book, Clandestine Relationships, A Black Man's Odyssey into the Ku Klux Klan. We're gonna talk with Daryl first by phone. Thank you so much for being there, Daryl. Thank you for having me. All right, very good. The KKK, <laughs> You had an opportunity to have an experience like nobody's business. I'm just going to turn it over to you. Tell us, what was that like for you, Daryl? And what well, did you it, do? It still goes on, you know. Our country can only become what it's too safe. That which we let it become and that which we make it. So tell us about your experience with the KKK. Um, how did that come about just briefly and 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 just kind of... Give us an overview of, of your book. Okay, well, what I did was I went around the country interviewing members and leaders of the Ku Klux Klan to find out, you know, what is making them sick. After having a racist experience at the age of 10, I had formed a question in my mind, which was, how can you hate me when you don't even know me? So who better to ask than someone who would join an organization whose whole history, 150 years, has been practicing hating people who do not look like them and who do not believe as they believe. So I sought out the members of this organization to question them directly. And I put it in my book, Clandestine Relationships. Mm. And you found out some um, important, uh, well, some interesting things about all of this, and it pointed to ignorance, uh, from what I can tell. Absolutely, you know, lack of exposure and, uh, and ignorance, you know, lack of education on the topic of race. And can you tell us uh, what uh, you have been able to get more than 200 now Klansmen to give you their robes and to walk away from this life, this, this type of life? That is correct. Now, I don't want to say that I converted them. They converted themselves. But I was the impetus uh, for that conversion. And give us an example. And that comes through, again, you know, having dialogue, having, having these conversations. And some of them can be very, very difficult. And they don't happen overnight. They happen over time. But in this country, we spend too much time talking about each other or talking at each other or talking past each other. And what I've chosen to do in this situation is sit down and talk with each other. Yeah, I noticed that one of the common denominators in a lot of what you were able to accomplish had to do with you saying that it was better to keep conversation, keep talking, because not talking meant possibly fighting. <laughs> so, well, yeah. I mean, yeah. you know, when two enemies are talking, they're not fighting. They're talking. They might be yelling and screaming, but at least they're talking. It's when the conversation ceases that the ground becomes fertile for violence. So you want to keep the conversation going. So what was your most interesting, I, you, you tell us, what was one of those most well, interesting conversations that led to a, a, a Klansman uh, giving up that life and, 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 and his robe? Well, getting to, you know, them getting to see somebody who does not look like them, who may not share you know, their ideology, to humanize them, to see, to see them regard you as a human being because they never sat down and had a social conversation with somebody uh, other than, you know, their own kind, somebody within, within their own group. And, and to see that evolve uh, was, was you know, very fascinating. I, I saw it many, many times. Now, not to say that every white supremacist or every Klansman or whatever is going to change. No, there will be those who will go to their grave being hateful, violent, and racist. But those who will take the opportunity to sit down and talk with someone, a black man, a Jewish person, a Muslim, what have you, these, these things can plant seeds and become the impetus for possible change. And that's where I come in. And so what are you doing now with all of the information that you've gathered and or all of the robes you have now from the KKK? 
Well, I plan on, on uh, opening a museum. I've got my 501c3. I'm currently looking for a building to house all this stuff, and I have a ton of stuff, you know, that, you know, that I want to put on display so that we never forget where we came from and where we can go. And let me ask you one more question. Um, our panelists tonight are civil rights powerhouses in the community we love to go to whenever there's an issue like what we're talking about tonight, blackface controversy. What is your take on all of this, um, given your experience um, and, and, and what you know, and then having this happen? What is, what is your take on it? Okay, well, I'm a musician, first and foremost. And, you know, uh, we, we had a lot of blackface before the 20th century with our minstrels and things like that, where it wasn't so controversial. Then later on, it did become controversial when people would engage in that for mockery and buffoonery of our black people. But I want to point out something that I think is very important and oftentimes uh, neglected. And I'm not advocating black faith, but I do want to point out something. That uh, Al Jolson, the uh, great entertainer, white entertainer from the 1920s, who wore black faith, he was not a racist, and he did not wear blackface in mockery or a buffoonery of, a, of black people. He idolized black people, and he is one of the first uh, white people to fight for civil rights in that era for black people. He fought very hard uh, for Broadway to hire black musicians and black actors because Broadway was racist and not hiring any black talent. He fought, and he was able to get uh, Eugene Blake, the great jazz, ragtime black pianist, onto Broadway. And that was Al Jolson doing that. Al Jolson in the 1920s was like uh, Elvis Presley in the 1950s. He was the thing back then, and he put his own career on the line for black people. Now, um, some you know, other people would take blackface and put it on, as I said, to do mockery and buffoonery. And that painted what, uh, what Al Jolson was doing. But Al Jolson has, has been revered by people like Sammy Davis Jr., uh, the Nicholas Brothers, Ella Fitzgerald, the Hines Brothers, et cetera, for opening those doors for black entertainers. But when you have somebody like, uh, like Ralph Northup of Virginia <clears throat> uh, doing that in mockery, and, and, and this is definitely not, uh, out, out of any uh, idolization of, uh, of black people. Like, you know, he tried to do it to pass it off as he put on blackface to, uh, to imitate Michael Jackson or something. Uh, Michael Jackson would never stand side by side with, a, with, a, with uh, somebody wearing a Klan robe and hood. Now, I would because I, I'm in that kind of business. I'm, I'm going around interviewing these people, and there are tons of pictures of me standing with uh, fully robed and hooded uh, Klansmen. But uh, what bothers me about, about Ralph Northam, uh, apart from the fact that he did this, was that he confirmed uh, his ideology when he put himself in the same frame of a photograph standing next to a uh, member of the Ku Klux Klan. If I'd just seen uh, him in blackface in a picture by himself, I would be questionable. Um, I, I would not jump to conclusions as to where he stood but he defined it himself when he put himself in there with a member of the KKK. For example, uh, the swastika wa uh, was around long, long before Adolf Hitler. Uh, it is still used in India. I was in India last year to give lectures, and it's, it's, it's a symbol that they use over there that has nothing whatsoever to do with uh, white supremacy or anti-Semitism. So if you were to see a swastika uh, in, in the same frame uh, uh, with, uh, with an Indian uh, clergy, say Mahatma Gandhi or somebody like that, it would be no big deal. But if you saw a swastika in the same frame at, uh, with somebody like Adolf Hitler, it means a whole different thing. So when you see <clears throat> a picture of somebody in blackface standing next to a Klansman, then you know exactly what that stands for. And what bothered me about Ralph Northam was he did not own it like, uh, like Mark Herring did. Mark Herring did a stupid thing uh, 19 years old at some college party or whatever, uh, putting it on. But at least he came forward, got ahead of it, and said, yes, I did that. It was stupid. I apologize. Uh, it was you know, an, an error on my part. He 
learned from it, whereby <clears throat> Ralph Northam apologized uh, and owned it and then denied it. So that tells me, well, wait a minute, you know, you're, you're the governor of a state. So if we can't trust you to tell the truth and, and own something one day and deny it the other, how are you going to leave the state of Virginia if you screw something up? Are you going to uh, lie about that as well? So that's, that, you know, that's my problem with uh, Ralph Northam. Well, you bring up some interesting points, and I'm sure we're going to be discussing it with our panel here uh, tonight. Uh, just want to give you any closing thought or um, word before we let you go. Daryl? Well, I think, you know, we need to, to always look at the context in which something was done and whether or not somebody owns it. Uh, and takes and takes accountability and responsibility. You know, we can we we can never forget, but we can forgive, but we cannot forgive a lie. And there you have it, Daryl Davis, author, musician, joining us here on the Aware Show. Thank you so much for being there, Daryl. We appreciate Thank your comments. You. All right, and that gives us a backdrop to bring come back to the set and just talk with with our civil rights uh, panelists that we brought on to talk about blackface and all the controversy that we're hearing about in the news these days, he makes some very important points, some, some good points, K.H.K. Mm -hmm. You got anything yeah. that, um, that you want to bounce off of from that? No, not necessarily. I, I'm in agreement with you. He made some valid points. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, when he mentioned Al Jolson, the difference being with him is that he did it in a positive light in trying to uh, bring about something uh, that was not in play at that time. He's trying to bring about some equality. But Nordstrom and uh, this crew that's doing it now, uh, doing it for totally different reasons, totally opposite reasons. They're doing it to be insulting, to be demeaning. And, and I think the most demeaning thing about Nordstrom is the fact that he, he doesn't remember that it was him. Uh, you know, he, 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 one day he apologizes for it. The next day uh, he doesn't Chicken know whether friends. that was him or not. And then he crawfishes on his apology. So, which leads me to believe that his intent was to hurt. His mm. intent was to insult which has a totally opposite meaning, a totally opposite intention from that of Al Jolson. Uh, we know that, uh, and I remember that story about Jolson, and I really, really remember the story about the governor mm -hmm. uh, because he is letting us know in no uncertain terms, that's me, that's the way I feel, that's my mentality, and uh, I think that those of you who are opposed to it are ignorant. Any comments from over here? Because I was just, my, my, my thing zooming in and focusing on that, uh, what you're just saying about uh, uh, Governor Northam is that um, a lot of times we do silly things when we're young and we're in college and, and that sort of thing, but you, you, you have a chance now, <laughs> you're not in college, <laughs> you, you know, you, you, you have an opportunity now to, to make it right. And I don't know, uh, I'm certainly not insinuating that he's not telling the truth when he, but the flip-flopping does leave a, a, a little suspect there. Yes, it does. And you have an opportunity to look at a photo. I can look at a photo when I was younger and I can tell you whether that was me or not. Mm. Uh, I, you know, I think the gentleman uh, know whether he was in the photo or not. Uh, I think a lot of times politics come into play when people want to be reelected or they're seeking a office, they would say what they feel that the crowd that they're appealing to want to hear. Okay. And I think this is where we are with that. Gary? I want to go back to Al Joseph. <clears throat> you know, there were some positive things he did later but the damage that was uh, being done to, to black people in the early stages of his life was still significant. And, uh, you know, even though you, some, you, know, you can be forgiven for some of the things you've done, but the damage that was done at that time, um, the demeaning and the disbasing of black people in that area, 
it lasts even to this day. Uh, you go back to the birth of a nation. The birth of a nation, the movie Birth of a Nation was uh, back in 1915 by D.W. Griffin. It did more damage to black people than I believe slavery did. And slavery was one of the most cruel entity ever in the history of the world, that, here in America, this slavery. But coming out of slavery, we was progressing. We were building towns and cities. But once this movie came out, it was a recruitment. Uh, it, it recruited the Klan in numbers such as they had never seen or even believed they could. And because of this, this damage that was done before and that was continued to be, in, uh, be done, um, it gave uh, the Klan power, prestige, and it showed, you know, these, these white guys that painted them face, their face to look like black men. And to show that the people that was in the legislators, the legislators, what they foot up on smoking cigars and being uh, character to as uh, cartoonist characters, uh, you know, not knowing, you know, just, just out and out, uh, being um, uh, disgraceful to the black legislators, and not only the black legislators, but also black people in general. And, Jerry, and it did irreparable damage. And, and I, want, I want to stay right there where you are and mm -hmm. dig even deeper into mm -hmm. what you're saying about mm -hmm. the irrevocable damage that's been done mm -hmm. through the years because a lot of people are going to be watching and they're going to say, I don't see the big deal with this. Mm -hmm. So give us a little historical perspective on this, if you will. Where, wh how deep does this thing go for what we're talking well, about? Well, first... Coming, you know, it was already, the degradation was already done when we was in slavery. Mm -hmm. uh, humanity was forced into slavery. Coming out of slavery, uh, as I said earlier, we was building uh, towns and uh, we had the skills and knowledge to, to move forward. But then came the vacancy laws that once you was out of slavery, going, if you was headed north, you could get put in jail because you didn't have a job. Then the lease law from the jail put you right back in the cotton field, back on the plantation. Uh, you could be put in jail up to a year to five years for just being a vagrant. Then the, with these black faces, it made people, the, the white populace, believe that we were actually dumb, uh, ignorant, stupid people. Even though we were, had all the skills at that time, we were building uh, America. We were building the South. We were building the homes that the people lived in. Uh, we built the schools and everything else that they, they were using. But this um, ministry shows, they did um, continue to around the country. This was done all around the country. People would be paint a paint black face with these uh, red lips, you know, these big mm -hmm. red lips using dialect that, that, you know, from the slave, uh, because we couldn't speak the language, although people thought we was ignorant because we couldn't speak English because we came out of Africa. We was using dialect from Africa. So they used that again to further degrade, dehumanize, and, and really totally destroy uh, the image of the black man and woman in this country. H.K.? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I want to piggyback on something mm -hmm. that Jerry said mm -hmm. about um, Al Jolson, mm -hmm. because no matter how well mm -hmm. intentioned mm -hmm. he might have been, mm -hmm. Jerry mentioned the fact that irreparable damage mm -hmm. was still done. Mm -hmm. Even though he, you know, might have had good intentions and in trying to uh, get some promotion, uh, uh, get us into another place, but the damage was done, mm -hmm. and uh, it's 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 not always the use of something; uh, it's the misuse mm -hmm. of things. This is the one of the things, Jerry and uh, Ellison. You both remember the uh, the fight that we had at Escambia High School about the symbols was not the use of the symbols, but the misuse of the symbols, which causes pain to those of us 
who have to be subjected to that kind of uh, action and that kind of thinking. So yeah. I just wanted to. Uh, well, thanks. Uh, yeah. 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 Thank you. Thanks for doing mm -hmm. that, and Jerry. Mm -hmm. um, also, you're um, kind of on a roll talking about some of the. Um, the historical perspective of this and digging deeper and, and going into the early stages of some of these demeaning characters mm -hmm. and, and what we saw unfold. I know you did, mm -hmm. HK, and some of these characters. Tell us about this from Jim Crow and and uh, and, and, and Zip Coon and, and uh, Piccaninny, <laughs> all, the, all of these things. Amos, uh, Annie, yeah. the, yeah. the, the, the controversy. Andy. I mean, it's just, it's, it's been going on a minute. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> tell, us, tell us a little well, bit about the history. Well, the, the damage was done to the psyche of mm -hmm. both people people mm -hmm. because it, it, it gave the, the false sense to uh, our white brothers and sisters that they were superior and to us that we was inferior. And then it continues in the educational system. Uh, we was taught about George Washington but nothing about ourselves in Africa. So we was being taught uh, uh, inferior and superior history. So all through our growing up, all through history, all through the from the Jim Crow area, era, that you know the white and colored water fountain. You know, I remember someone said they wanted to taste that water and see what it tastes like because mm. one said white, one said colored. Mm. But the 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 the, the, huma, the the inhumanity that took place at that time in this period of history ha is still has a psychological effect to this day because there are people still think that we are ignorant people. There, there are people still think that if you see a black person, they're going to do something to you. There are people calling the police right now as you walk by. You know, you, you're talking about people that call police on people out there, you know, they gave these people names, Bobby mm. Q, Becky, and mm. all of them. Mm. They are doing these things right now because of the atmosphere that is being set, even to this day, but the Jim Crow era did um, um, so much damage. Mm. And uh, I think the, the the people came out of slavery with a positive attitude. Mm -hmm. Black people did. They was like I said before. They came out building and doing all kinds of things. Building schools. They were reading. They were, their education was the key. They understood that even into the 50s and 60s. Then came the era of um, now, where you know movies begin to. There was there are songs even to this day, mimicking. People don't even understand the psychology of it. And some of the music that we play is mimicking the ministry shows that took place back then. You know, then. when you go back and you start even just popping in things on the internet and you start doing a little research on some of this and you start seeing some of these characters, mm -hmm. uh, the Uncle Tom and, mm -hmm. you know, and, and, and the Mammy and things like mm -hmm. that, and you start really digging into the history of it, then you see why it's kind of demeaning. It's very demeaning. Mm -hmm. I, I won't even say kind. It's very demeaning very. Um, to have these characters uh, uh, kind of it, placed in an app American's face, and in this regard, in blackface. Ellison? Yes, and, and the problem we have, our young people are not being taught uh, black history, African American history is not taught at every school level, um, and if you don't know your history, how can you teach it to the next generation that's coming along? And, and that's what's shameful when we do not teach uh, black history as part of, of American history. Mm H.K., -hmm. do you have anything? Because uh, Jerry's uh, got... Well, I, I, I was just going to, again, <laughs> piggyback on Jerry. Uh, when he mentioned about, and Ellison, about black history and mm -hmm. what we're doing, and this is why I speak all over this country and uh, for black history programs. And uh, when people ask me what I think about Black History Month, I have one pat answer, and that's nothing. Mm -hmm. Because when Jerry was mentioning uh, the things that we built and all of this kind of mm -hmm. stuff, uh, that's our history. Our history is America's history. America's history is our history. Mm -hmm. And there's no way 
uh, under God's Son that we can talk about or uh, uh, even crack the barrier on all of the inventions, all of the discoveries, all of the things that black people have done in this country. We built this country on our backs with our sweat and our blood. We made this country what it is. So I, I just wanted to add that and, and wanted to also mention that governor who uh, not only had the black face, but had the Klan uniform next to him. Mm -hmm. That's a... Uh, which was brought up also by uh, Daryl Davis. Yeah. And, 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 and going back to that, mm -hmm. what he should have admitted was that was the culture that he grew up in. It, the, you know, I went back and did some research, or we did some research, found out there was not a school hardly in Virginia that didn't use blackface. As a matter of fact, there, there was their that was it was big parties and parades and all of that was a part of what they did and he should have admitted on it as uh, Reverend Matthew said and said yeah I did that yeah. you know uh, one of these guys is me mm. you know because at first he came out and apologized if, if you come out and apologize and say you know I, I'm owning this I did that when I was younger. And, and what made me even uh, more sadder, this man was a doctor, he was a doctor. And if you got that kind of attitude, what did you, how did you deal with the people that you, you uh, handle, you know, as a pedi pediatrician? Right, as your patients. Yeah, as mm -hmm. your patient. How, how did you handle those individuals? How do, what, what did you do to make sure they are helped uh, was uh, the, the healing process took place. So it's a lot of issues there, yeah. you know, and he need to come clean with that. And if black people don't have the hate gene. <laughs> <laughs> they really don't. I, I, you, you, people kill their whole, a whole family get killed. And you see the people on TV the next day, I forgive that person. We, we're not going to follow nobody to the end of the earth to to, mm -hmm. to go to war with them. Mm -hmm. So we don't have that hate gene. So it, pe black people are already in Virginia, 70-some uh, percent or 60-some percent, one, somewhere around there saying, no, uh, we don't want the man to go. Mm -hmm. We elected this man because mm -hmm. we don't want this other guy here. So, you know, we have to look at what they want also. Mm -hmm. You know, what, 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 did they, what do they see, the need in their, in their state that we don't see? you know, from a distance, even though we know what, <laughs> mm -hmm. what happened was, was atrocious. Right. You know, so we have to look at it that way. Also, going back to, to the black face, we, black people in movies had to play black face, even though yes. their face was already black. Right. They was forced to do it uh, in, uh, in order to get a job. You know, you had to step Stephen Fletcher, uh, Willie Bess, one of the most famous, Billy Bojangle, Bojangle. He, all of these uh, people had to play, use blackface in order to even get a part in the movie, uh, even though they was already black. Yeah. You know, uh, Eddie Roach Anderson, all of these are great men. But then you had uh, uh, Bob Hope. You had uh, um, all of these other uh, top movie stars back then that played in blackface. Mm -hmm. uh, um, uh, Fred Astaire, many of them. So we have to look at the culture. We have to look at how it diminished black people. But and then the country, the country need to uh, reconcile this deal that. Uh, come to some kind of conclusion, say, we're going to apologize for what we did and make some recompense for what we have done. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, we uh, were in a position that we were always having to giggle and laugh when we weren't tickled. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We had to scratch where we didn't itch. We had to pretend that we were happy when we were actually very unhappy. And this is what was expected of us. And, of course, now it's, it's, it's a shocker to a lot of people on the other side uh, because we finally woke up a little bit and realized that laughing when we weren't tickled was a waste of energy mm. and scratching when we uh, weren't itching mm -hmm. was, you know, just taking up 
some of our energy also. Mm-hmm. So, but we have to know ourselves as a people. Amen. And, and know who we are, know what we're capable of doing, and know that we are not what people portray us as being. Mm-hmm. HK, you grew up with some of what Jerry is talking about. And we were getting hit, mm-hmm. it, hits and bits of it as we were coming along mm-hmm. um, in some of the spinoffs of this, <laughs> some of the TV shows we watched, right. uh, some of the movies that came cartoons. out with black or exploitation, <laughs> some of the cartoons mm-hmm. and that sort of thing. You're a little older than we are. <laughs> just so, live. I mean, you Just, just <laughs> live it. Just so, I mean, what was that like? And, where, and as you look back on all of that now, you know, what is your reflection uh, of all of that? I look back with, I don't know, a degree of sadness and also a degree of gladness. Uh, Sadness in that we had to endure uh, openly. I mean, it it, it was not cryptic. It was not hidden. We had to endure that kind of, of, of racism. Gladness in that we as a people finally found the courage to say no more Mm. and speak up and try to put a stop to it. And yet we're living in an era now that where some people are trying to take us back to a time that never should have been. And they're trying to roll back the clock. And we have got to stand firm because, you know, I, I, I grew up listening to People on the other side call my grandmother Annie, but they weren't her nephews and nieces. Mm-hmm. And they called me boy, and I had certainly reached my majority. Mm-hmm. Uh, if they didn't call me boy, they called me uncle. And, and even though I'd reached my majority, I wasn't old enough to be their uncle. Mm-hmm. <laughs> uh, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's kind of like uh, a, a fella came through town and asked a black man, said, uh, Preacher, how do I get to the colored section of town? He said, well, I really don't know how you get over there. He said, well, you ought to know. You live here. He said, well, you ought to know how to get over there because you knew that I was a preacher. Well, he was not a preacher. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So you, uh, we have got to realize that we, as a people, must stop putting all of the blame on the other side. Okay, mm-hmm. that's good. We've got to share some of it ourselves mm-hmm. okay. for being complacent, uh, for being uh, suffering from selective amnesia when we get to a point in our lives that we can do some things that we previously were not able to do, and then looking, forgetting about those who have not yet reached that plateau. So we must do that. Okay. And we also would be remiss if we, you know, if you think this is just happening in Virginia. Right. uh, Well, we've got an example of uh, here in Florida. Uh, Michael Ertal, the Florida Secretary of State, uh, recently stepped down as well after having uh, been uh, admitting to the blackface controversy that we're talking about here today. So yes, even here in the Sunshine State, um, we have had to have to deal with this. So um, it, it, it's something that's in our backyard and it's something that's in all of our faces. And we all are, like you said, we all have a responsibility in this. And, and we and may I, not put on a black face, but we don't have to be complacent. We don't have to not take our share of the responsibility and what we can do to make things like this uh, aware, make it aware, uh, help people be aware that this is going on. So we, we take a responsibility in, in doing that. And I think HK? we need to be aware of the fact that this is not something that's localized. It's not something, right. Mm-hmm. Right. you know, this is universal. Oh, yeah. This is all and, and, over. And speaking of that, 
we have some other images we want to share because it even uh, seeped into the fashion industry. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> and yeah. it, was, it wasn't cool. Mm -hmm. no. <laughs> um, uh, Prada had um, the little clip on for your purses and, and, and the picture of, um, I, I'm not sure what it, what it was supposed to be. I don't really want to know, but mm -hmm. I, what I do know is mm -hmm. I, it didn't make me feel good to see that mm -hmm. people were buying these and putting them on their purses. Gucci, Gucci yeah. had the sweater that okay. with the black, the big red lips on it. You pull it up over halfway over your face and it's got the big red lips. Uh, one of the things... Uh, uh, and Burberry had the yeah, noose. Yeah, the noose, right. Mm -hmm. So one They of the, apologize. One of the things that, that other people need to learn is the history of America themselves. We, you know, all of us need to know the history, but other people need to know it even most, more so because they need to know what took place so that they won't continue to perpetuate the same thing over and over again. And some know it and will continue to perpetuate um, this false uh, lie or whatever you may want to call it, but there, there are those who will continue to do it because they want to degrade uh, people, to dehumanize and cause friction between people um, of different races. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And when we've got people at the top who perpetrate this kind of stuff, mm -hmm. what do we expect the folk who are underneath the people at the top right. to do? Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, that's the, the folk who do certain things to encourage this kind of activity. Mm -hmm. You know, some lady just resigned the other day, I don't know who it was, uh, from a position. And she was the one who had previously called Michelle Obama right. yeah. an ape in shoes, mm -hmm. an ape in heels. Mm -hmm. So, I, I mean, the mentality yeah. is, is so prevalent mm -hmm. in so many people, and I'm not saying all people, but in so many other people that, you know, we are just less than mm -hmm. as far as they're concerned. And it, it's, it's sad, it's saddening. Is hurtful. The hurtful thing is that we as a group, as a people, need to cling to each other. We need to turn to each other mm -hmm. and not That's on good. Each I like other. that you're presenting the problem, but you're also giving us the <laughs> solutions, HK. <laughs> That's what we need to do. Ellison, you're getting quiet over here. We're going to bring you back into the conversation. <laughs> yes, I, I'm, I'm, I'm listening and uh, learning uh, all the time, but we are at a place <clears throat> in this century, in this era uh, of what is going on on Capitol Hill. Uh, it is ludicrous to think that you can shut down a government and not harm human beings. It is ludicrous to think that you can take children who are in a foreign country from their parents and think that have no air, uh, lasting effect upon the child. Uh, so we, we, when, when a company uses uh, as part of their uh, logo to sell merchandise to make a profit off of something like a hangman's noose or a little monkey on the side of a handbag, uh, it, it's just wrong and it's shameful. And any company that does that should be ashamed and apologize nationally to everyone. You know, every time there's been progress in this country among the African American community, it's always been a backlash from Reconstruction up to the modern day President Barack Obama. As soon as he became president, it, it gave rise and it, it metastasized itself. The racism that was dormant came boiling out. It was, it was like a festering sore, and it came boiling out. And then uh, with a, a man who ran for president, used that to uh, denigrate this man, to say that he was not born in America, that he was not a citizen, that he was born somewhere else, that, you know, use race to uh, mobilize people uh, and bring them to the point where uh, they be begin to hate people just because of the color of their skin. And that's always been the case. Uh, but um, race 
wasn't a problem to the early 1600s. And now it has metastasized itself throughout the whole of human society. And it's, it's gonna come to an head someday. And the thing about it, if we don't sit down and, and try to bring some uh, justice to and deal with each other on an egalitarian principle, uh, you can be looking at wars, the total breakdown of law and order, all kinds of things that's taking place because we need to be working on the issues of climate change, food shortage, all of these things that, that all of the intelligent people need to be doing. We are not doing that. We are, we are dealing with issues that should have been uh, debased a long time ago. <laughs> that, that's that's deep. <laughs> that, that, that's good, Jerry. Because that, that's almost a thought to end on. <laughs> um, going forward, um, uh, two truths and and a myth. I'll call it. Um, what would what would that be in all of this? Two truths and a myth. The truth is that um, you know. The truth is that. None of this stuff that that the Bojangles and all of that didn't it, it did irreparable damage. The other truth is that we were always intelligent people. Uh, when we came from Africa, we came with the intellect. We just couldn't speak the English language, and then there were different languages on the ships that came, and so those individuals couldn't couldn't understand each other. But we had the drum. With the mm -hmm. drum, we could communicate. <laughs> and that's why the drum was banned for so long in mm -hmm. America. <laughs> and, and what's the myth? The myth is that we are ignorant people. You've kind of been telling us the whole time. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the myth is that we are, we are, we are mm -hmm. ignorant people, and that's a myth, and, uh, and it will ever be a myth. Mm -hmm. You know, it's ironic. I <laughs> love that you say the, the drums. We had mm -hmm. the drums. That's how yeah. we communicated. Mm -hmm. Music is a universal right. language for everyone, mm -hmm. and, and we certainly saw that uh, even with Daryl Davis earlier, who uh, wrote the book about the Ku Klux Klan, mm -hmm. one of his uh, very opportunities to, to get a Klansman to look and see uh, his wrongdoing had to do with music. He was surprised that Daryl could actually play mm -hmm. the piano the way he could. And he said, mm -hmm. I can't believe a black man is playing that like Jerry Lee Lewis. <laughs> and and, and Daryl actually said, who do you think taught <laughs> Jerry no, Lee Lewis? Right. <laughs> <laughs> and then that began to change this man's perspective. Yeah. And all of a sudden, there he was. Mm -hmm. And so uh, we've got to wrap up the AWARE show. but. We would be remiss if we didn't get an opportunity to just kind of go around the round table here in our civil rights discussion and talking about the blackface uh, controversy and give you some lasting, uh, some last words. I Ellison? think it's insulting. Mm -hmm. I really do. I think we need as a people to understand uh, if you never look at a person mm -hmm. and try to apologize for yes. your behavior, yes, you continue to do the same thing. That's deep. We just have to have a deeper appreciation for history. Uh, one of the things I always say, if we don't have an appreciation for history, we want to study history. So both people need to study the history of what has been, what has taken place. Very good. Last word. Last word is, I'm in total agreement with what Jerry just said. <laughs> <laughs> That is all the time we have for now. I want to thank all of my guests, and I want to tell you to be sure to get out and celebrate black history. It is American history, our shared history, and it's history that we all can embrace. And it's 365 days a year to do it, not just one month, the smallest month of the entire year. February. Our show today also highlighted the blackface controversy. It is a conversation with many views and many faces, as you see. It's a tough conversation to have, but it's an important one. And I hope today's discussion gave insight and food for thought. If you see this subject as funny, then perhaps you missed the whole point. If it's a point that raises your brow, then perhaps it's worth exploring. After all, are we our brother's keeper? I'm Dee Dee Sharp. Until the next time, stay informed and stay aware.